Hi, my name is Steven Greider. In this video, we're going to talk about whether you should spend your time learning React Native or Flutter. I put together a couple of high-level topics to compare and contrast both these mobile frameworks. The two biggest things that we're going to talk about, or kind of the big drivers and differences between the two, are the feature set and the nature of the corporate sponsors behind both React Native and Flutter. Now, this video is going to be a little bit longer, so I've placed links to each of these sections inside this video's description. In addition, quick note, you might try listening to this video at 1.5 speed, and you can find the setting for that on the bottom right hand side of the YouTube video player. So let's get to it. Let's talk about the differences in feature set between React Native and Flutter. Okay, here we go. Now, quick disclaimer here, when I say feature set of React Native or feature set of Flutter, I'm talking about what we get with React Native and Flutter out of the box without any additional third-party dependencies. Because as soon as we start installing dependencies, well, that's something that we'll get into. That's something we'll talk about in a little bit. So when we consider just React Native by itself, we actually get a fairly limited number of features. We get the ability to show content on the screen of the device, and we also get some very solid access to different pieces of implementation or different features of the physical device itself. So for example, the ability to access the camera of the device or the ability to get the device's G location or like GPS location. So when we make use of React Native, there really is a rather very limited feature set. And if we want to do anything advanced here, like navigation or testing or anything else like that, we have to start reaching for third-party dependencies. Now, in the world of Flutter, Flutter is really a batteries-included mobile framework. When you make use of Flutter and you install it on your local machine, that's pretty much it. You have everything you need to make a complete mobile application. There's no need to reach out to some dependency management and install some number of additional packages that are going to give you access to navigation or something for testing or something for state management. You just install Flutter, you generate the application, and that's it. You really got everything you need. Now, in general, this is kind of something that falls in favor of Flutter because it means that we don't have to rely upon these third-party libraries that are authored by other developers who kind of might be maintaining this library as a side project or just something that they just kind of want to do for fun. In other words, I kind of trust Flutter's ability for navigation over some third-party dependency for navigation with React Native. So for feature set, I personally think that Flutter kind of wins out and it's a little bit better oriented. All right, so next up, let's talk about the next big item, corporate sponsors. Now, quick disclaimer here on corporate sponsors, this next point on kind of the nature of Facebook versus Google is very much my own opinion. And it's kind of some, you know, based on my beliefs, not necessarily the truth, it's just kind of what I've noticed about the community. Okay, so here's the big question about the corporate sponsors of Facebook and Google and why they support React Native and Flutter. Now, the big question here is why did Facebook and Google open source both these mobile frameworks? That's the big question. I've got a couple of ideas here. So I think in the case of Facebook, I think that they open sourced React Native because they wanted to get more developers testing React Native, writing code for it, developing tests, making sure that it works the way they expect. And I think that's probably the case of Flutter as well. Secondly, I think that in the case of Facebook with React Native, I very, very much believe that they open source React Native to kind of generate interest and buzz over their engineering department and make you think, oh, wow, they authored React Native. Well, that's a great solution. That's a great mobile framework. I think the engineering team at Facebook is really strong and top notch, and I would want to work there. And so by open sourcing React Native, they're kind of generating a little bit of buzz and marketing for the company itself. Now, this right here, this is not something that I'm guessing on. This is not something that I'm making up. I on a story here, a couple of years ago, I went to a React Native meetup. I met some of the core developers of React Native, and this was a question I very directly asked them. I said, why did you open source React Native? And the answer that I got back very directly was, well, it increases visibility of Facebook in the development community. So honestly, that's what was communicated to me. And even though it was a couple of years old, I still believe it to this day. Now, that's definitely true of Google as well. By open sourcing Flutter, they get the ability for people to think, wow, Google engineers are top notch. They made something as awesome as Flutter. That's just terrific. However, in the case of Flutter, there's one very big additional thing that kind of goes in favor of Flutter. 
when Google made Flutter, they didn't do it to just open source the mobile framework and say, hey, if you want to build a mobile app, here you go. In reality, they built Flutter because Google owns Android and they have a huge financial stake in Android. They want you, they want you as a developer to build applications for Android. And so it is in their interest, it is in Google's interest to make sure that developing applications for Android is as easy and straightforward as possible. And so personally, I believe that's a big reason on why Google open source Flutter and why they created it in the first place. They want making the applications to be very easy and very straightforward. And so this is something that kind of falls in favor of Google. Google wants you to have a very easy time to make applications. And so I kind of personally believe that, you know, hey, that's, that's a point in favor of Google. They want it to be easy. They're gonna write their documentation. They're gonna make the tools. They're gonna make everything they can as easy as possible for you to learn Flutter and get started with it. Not quite much so much the case with Facebook and React Native. If you use React Native, that's great. But at the end of the day, if you decide not to use it, well, that's kind of all the same to them. All right, so that's kind of my take on the corporate sponsors behind both these. Now I'll talk a little bit about the language choice for both of them. So language choice with React Native over here, we of course get the option of using JavaScript, which is a dynamically typed language. We also get the ability to use languages that compile to JavaScript, such as JavaScript or Java, excuse me, TypeScript or JavaScript with Flow. And so with TypeScript or JavaScript with Flow, we get the ability to add in static typing to the code that we write. Now, whether or not you like static typing is kind of a, another discussion here. In the case of Flutter, we get use of Dart only. That's the only language we can use to make Flutter applications. So Dart is a statically typed language, rather similar to TypeScript, also rather similar in syntax to JavaScript. So in total here, well, with Flutter, you don't get access to JavaScript, which is, might be something that you already know and are familiar with right now. And so I kind of got to fall in favor of React Native in this case, because you get a wide choice of languages that you can use to develop React Native applications. Okay, so next up, difficulty curve. Now, difficulty curve and productivity here, these, of course, are very subjective ratings on my part. I have taught courses and I've built many mobile apps with React Native. I've only built one with Flutter professionally so far. And so my opinion on difficulty curve here and productivity is kind of subjective. I've got some experience to be able to say like, yes, this is easier, this is harder. But at the end of the day, for every person, difficulty and curve and productivity will be a little bit different. All right, so here we go. First off, difficulty curve. So with React Native, I personally believe that we start off with a very low level for difficulty. Getting something to just appear on the screen is rather straightforward. It's not that challenging. But as soon as you start to want to do anything more complicated, like start to add in navigation, or add in state management, or add in testing, or any of these other very common things that you're going to want to do for a mobile application, you have to start installing these third-party libraries. And a lot of them, I'll be honest with you, not the best experience in the world. Again, these are libraries that are authored by people who might be doing this as a hobby. It's not a professional project for them. They're not being paid. So the quality is not always at its peak or as high as it could be. They do great efforts and the open source community around React Native is top notch, but perhaps it's you know, sometimes a little bit rough. I'll be honest, sometimes it is a little bit rough. And so with React Native, with a difficulty over time, as you start adding in these third-party dependencies and they start making breaking changes between each version that they release and you try to stay on top of versions, you're going to run into difficulty as you try to update these packages that you've added into your project. Now, in the case of Flutter, difficulty without a doubt starts a little bit higher, or maybe a lot higher, to be honest. The reason the difficulty is a little bit higher here there is a tremendous amount of built-in functionality with Flutter. There's a ton of documentation, there's a ton of different widgets, a ton of different classes that you have to learn, and on top of all that, chances are you also have to learn Dart as well. And so I think that when you're first getting started with Flutter, it's a little bit more challenging to get used to. But after that initial burst of difficulty, you start to kind of understand what's going on, you learn how to read the documentation, you understand the common widgets that you're going to use on the vast majority of applications. And after that point, difficulty without a doubt falls down and stays rather constant. And if anything, I would kind of say that it starts to continue falling down as you start to memorize and learn all these different widgets that you're going to be using over and over again. All right, so that's again, my take on difficulty curve. 
For other people, it might be a little bit different, but based on my experiences, this is kind of where I've seen it. All right, let's see what's next. Productivity, so this will be a fun one. Okay, so productivity. Again, with React Native, I think it's kind of the inverse of what you see with difficulty. When you first get started with productivity, very easy to get started, really easy to get content to appear on the screen of your device. However, over time, at some point in time, you're gonna say, oh, I want to add in navigation, or I want to add in testing, or whatever else it might be. That's when you start to need to reach for those third-party dependencies, and that's where you're gonna see this fall in productivity. As you start to make use of these packages that change all the time, documentation not always up to date, tons of open GitHub issues, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to get along with these third-party React Native packages. Now, in the case of Flutter over here, again, kind of the inverse curve here or inverse graph of what we just saw for difficulty. When you're first getting started with Flutter, it is a little bit challenging. You can get content on the screen of the device rather easily, but again, you have to spend a lot of time reading a lot of documentation and getting a good sense of what's going on. Now, after you get over that initial hump, after you learn the base classes, after you get a sense of how to read the documentation, you get this big jump and it kind of levels off as you start to realize, hey, you know, I can do this. I remember how to do these very common operations that you're going to do over and over and over again. And again, I might even expect for that curve to go, you know, just up a little bit. All right, so I think we're on to our last one, state management. So this is a good one, state management. So when I talk about state management, I'm talking about the ability to maintain data and have data flow throughout an application. So in the React Native world, we get access to the very default, very normal component level state, which is kind of a feature of React itself. And it's where we tie some amount of data directly to each different component that we are rendering on the screen of the device. We also get access to Redux, with, which without a doubt is the absolute gold standard of state management in the vast majority of a lot of different frameworks right now, not only on mobile, but also on web as well. So with React Native, very easy integration with Redux, great solution. I can't say enough good things about it. Personally, I very much enjoy Redux. And then as a side note, I'll also throw MobX on here. I have not worked with it that much myself, but it definitely is an option. I'm just gonna throw it on this diagram to be complete. Now, this is where Flutter kind of falls flat on its face. So it might sound like everything up to this point, I've been very much in favor of Flutter. With state management is where I kind of turn my back on it and say, ah, eh, still needs a little bit of work. So in the Flutter world, there are still a lot of, there's still a lot of indecisiveness. There's still a lot of people trying to decide what the best way is to architecture and design an application, especially when it starts to come down to management of data or state flowing throughout it. So by default, what you get for free with Flutter is something called stateful widgets. And if you're familiar with React at all, stateful widgets, very similar to component level state. But stateful widgets, not that great for larger applications. In fact, it's probably horrible for larger applications. So for larger applications, right now there's kind of three contending solutions. One is called scope models. Secondly, there is a implementation of Redux that is sp built specifically for Dart and Flutter. And then finally, there's something that's been very publicly endorsed by the Flutter team called the block pattern. So you're probably not gonna use stateful widgets on anything besides the most straightforward and simple application. You're probably gonna end up picking one of these three solutions right here. And again, there is absolutely no community census, consensus on what the best approach is. Now, personally, I've gone through a lot of experience with the block pattern, and that is what the Flutter team recommends. However, the downside to the block pattern is that it requires a lot, just a lot of previous programming experience, in particular around the realm of reactive programming. So if you've ever heard of the concept of streams or stream controllers, that's what the block pattern makes use of, and it's pretty darn hard to get started with. Pretty challenging to get started with, without a doubt. Okay, so that's it. That's some of the high-level points I want to share with you about whether you might choose to use Flutter or React Native. Again, this isn't really a choice that I can make for you. I can only present you with some of the pros and cons between the two. Honestly, it, today, if you're getting started and you've never spent any time with either of them, I would kind of recommend checking out Flutter because even though in some respects, it's a little bit harder to get started with, it's also going to help you develop as an engineer because there's a lot of concepts around Dart and Flutter 
that are very commonly reflected in a lot of other programming languages and a lot of other different frameworks out there. Not quite so much with React Native. React Native skills or skills that you gain with React Native most closely translate to just plain old React JS on the web. So a little bit more constrained translation of the knowledge that you'll gain there. Now, last thing I want to share with you, if you liked what I said, or if any of this stuff seems really interesting, I do have courses on both Dart and Flutter and React Native hosted over on udemy.com. If you want to check them out, I got links to both these courses in the description to this video. So just scroll down a little bit and check out the links to both of them. I do have courses on both these topics. So honestly, I'm not really, uh, you know, I'm not really a fanboy of either one per se. I'm not really trying to say you should go for this one over that one. My honest impression right now is that if I, I was personally just getting started, I might trend a little bit more towards Dart and Flutter. Okay, so that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this description. I hope it's clarified a couple of things. So I'll catch you later.